Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so this talk is um, uh, by way of experience sharing. Um, uh, Rich and I used to work at Sun Microsystems, um, which is getting to the point now where some of the younger viewers may not even know it ever existed. Um, but uh, Sun was a dynamic and uh, controversial corporation um, that expired in 2010 when Oracle uh, bought it. Uh, and um, while Rich and I worked for Sun Microsystems, uh, we were both involved in making the Java platform open source. And um, that was a controversial thing at the time. And we're going to explain a little bit about why it was controversial. And we're going to explain a little bit about what we did to try and make Java go open source smoothly. Uh, in that process, um, my role was as the uh, the chief open source officer at Sun. I was the head of open source. I was running one of the industry's first open source program offices. And the task that we're going to be talking about is very much an open source program office task. Uh, and the tool that we're going to be talking about is one that I have not noticed very many modern OSPOs actually thinking about or using. So I'd very much encourage you to consider uh, using this particular approach if you're working in an open source program office. Uh, uh, Rich's role at the time was to be the, um, the, the marketing guru for the Java team. And uh, this... Uh, uh, the technique that we're using was very much his brainchild that he pioneered, perfected, and uh, used to to great effect. And so we're going to we're going to talk you a little bit through that. And uh, on the slides, you see that there's um, two avatars. There's a, a little Rich and a little Simon, and that will give you some hint who is uh, going to take the lead on each of those slides. Uh, if you come back to this talk later and you want to ask questions. You can use those avatars as your um, your guide to know which of us to email to ask the question to. Um, so uh, Rich is going to take it from here. It turns out that I'd never realized this. Rich is um, a a competitor with Randall Monroe of XKCD because he he drew these. So over to you, Rich. Well, thanks, Simon. Um, so so why does why is it so difficult for companies to uh, communicate with? Uh, communities. Well, it's it really comes very uh, unnaturally to companies because um, marketing departments are used to adjusting the message for different audiences, and that doesn't really work very well for uh, for developer audiences. So we're going to talk about uh, what happens when you've got some explaining to do, uh, and we we had some explaining to do, and we used a really uh, boring old school technique uh, of the FAQ to solve that problem. Uh, next slide. So companies really don't always get it. A lot of companies uh, nowadays get it much better than uh, 15 years ago when we were at Sun. But uh, a lot of companies just don't really understand the open source uh, ethos, how, the way, how communities work. Uh, and um, even companies that do understand it have a tough time sometimes matching their uh, expectations and corporate interests with uh, the community's interests when they don't align. Next. So um, how many of you have, uh, have run into this problem? You, you roll out some terrific uh, program that you think everyone's going to love and out come the pitchforks and the torches. Uh, well, this is a problem that, that many of us have run into uh, and uh, you know, Simon, why don't you tell, talk a little about um, what uh, some of our experiences were at Sun with the the, for, the pitchforks and the, <laughs> uh, the torches. Okay. So uh, in many ways, Sun Microsystems was one of the first companies to use open source as a strategic uh, uh, approach. Um, the founding of the company used BSD Unix and used it as the operating system on workstations. And... Um, the, the one of the founders of the open source movement uh, was one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, that's Bill Joy. And he was doing that around about the same time that uh, Richard Stallman was working on the East Coast. So uh, Sun's history is very much intertwined with the history of the free and open source software movement. And um, 
uh, one of the problems with being a pioneer is that although you do things that are that are, are very effective and successful as a pioneer when you succeed a town gets built in the place where you used to be the pioneer and you don't fit in too well as one of the townspeople and that was what happened with some microsystems sun uh watched the uh open source movement emerge uh it always had a tense relationship with the east wing of the free and open source software movement and um by the time we got to uh the end of the 1990s um sun was uh it fairly routinely in conflict with the the the, the uh, free software movement led by richard stallman uh when java was released in uh, uh 1995 uh sun tried very hard to do it in a way that was um very open and, and fitted with its ethos and the licensing around java in 1995 was quite revolutionary it, it gave anybody the freedom to do anything they wanted to with the software as long as they weren't going to make money with it um they i don't know if that sounds familiar today so the the licensing that java had was this pioneering uh, completely uh, do what you want with this code license. And I know that was the case because I worked at IBM in 1995 and I started the Java lab at IBM using exactly those freedoms. And the, the whole fact that IBM came on board and popularized Java in the enterprise was all down to Sun's use of open licensing. Now, Sun assumed that everybody saw the worthiness and goodness of this, but it turned out that that wasn't the case, that lots of people were very upset about the strong field of use protections that were in the Java licensing ar ar arrangement. They were there for an excellent reason, as was shown when Microsoft tried to do a hostile fork of Java at the end of the 1990s. Uh, and the licensing proved that it worked well when Microsoft had to pay something like a billion dollars as damages for uh, their uh, attempt to uh, embrace, extend, and extinguish Java in the late 90s. So um, when we got to the turn of the century, a lot of people had, by that point, um, missed the openness and the loveliness of Sun and uh, really were um, out with the pitchforks and the scythes uh, trying to deal with us. Uh, Sun, one, one of Sun's great flaws is it, it failed to notice the growing power of Linux and of the free software movement. And uh, it it failed to fight that by making Solaris open source free software early in its life cycle. And uh, Sun said many bad things about um, uh, Linux, unfortunately. And in fact, its founder, uh, Scott McNeely, was known to do exactly that off the cuff during interviews. And so um, by the time we got to uh, the early 2000s, um, we had been fairly soundly denounced by Grok Law, the discussion forum. And we uh, had also had the delight of having Richard Stallman uh, write this uh, article where he declared that um, Java was uh, not just a, a trap, uh, by its licensing, taking away your freedoms, but also it created a whole class of evil that would forever be called the Java trap. And so uh, when in 2004, the Java team was, um, by then it, it had already been discussing making Java open source for about three years. And it was an unwelcome development, shall we say, that Richard decided uh, in 2004 to write this article. And so uh, one of my jobs as chief open source officer was to go and try and uh, solve these problems. And so uh, I spent quite a lot of time talking with the uh, with Pamela Jones, who uh, ran Groklaw, talking with the people in the free Java community to understand their problems. And we, we fairly quickly came to the conclusion that although uh, internally, we knew we were heading in the direction of open source for Java. No one outside was ever going to believe us. Uh, they had lots of questions and they had internally in their minds answered those questions in a, the worst possible way. And consequently, uh, we could come out uh, tomorrow back in 2004 and say that Java was open source and people would never trust us. And so, um, as part of the opening process, we learned about meeting people, talking with the community, 
uh, engaging the leaders of the community that we were working with. We also learned about not um, uh, trying to compete with the community and create a competing community. And so when we did our initial openings of Java, um, that was done by putting Java under a free to use license, a non free but free to use license, and putting it into Debian's non free repository. And we did that in, uh, in 2004. And uh, we implanted a member of our staff in the Debian community, Tom Marble, who is still there. Uh, he, he, he went native uh, fairly readily and um, uh, did a fine job working on Java in the, the Debian community. And also, one of the things we did while we were there was we, we, we wrote an FAQ explaining this complicated license that we used for Java in the world of Debian. And, and that's why when we came to actually open source Java in 2005, uh, Rich decided that this was exactly the tool to use to solve all the presenting problems that we had in open sourcing Java. So, uh, Rich, back to you. Thanks, Simon. So, so uh, next slide. So, well, so we're going to do this in the form of an FAQ. So question, why write an FAQ? Well, the number one reason to write an FAQ like this, I mean, you might have a community that has a very simple licensing. There's no controversy. Developers love you. They're using it. They're adopting it. You probably don't need this kind of FAQ. But if you've got any sort of controversy or things that aren't, aren't completely uh, uh, the way that the community uh, would want to see it, this can really help you out. But the number one reason why you want to write an FAQ is to learn the answers to these questions yourself. So writing an FAQ that really peels back the onion and goes deep on uh, the strategy and what you're trying to accomplish forces you, the company, and your executives and across the whole company, all of the different departments and uh, stakeholders to test and refine this strategy and really figure out what it is you're going to do. Get everyone on the same page so that there's no disagreement and no, uh, no cross purposes. And then teach all of the people who have to talk about this, what are the messages and um, how to explain this strategy to the community. And what this allows you to then do is establish trust because you're being completely transparent. You're putting everything out there on the table so that everyone can figure it out. If you can answer the difficult questions about your strategy intelligently, then you've got a coherent strategy. If you can't answer those questions, you probably need to go back to the drawing board. Next uh, slide. So who's the audience? Well. In a nutshell, the audience is developers. Marketing people are comfortable with having this message for sale for the uh, customers, this message for the engineers, different messages for different audiences. But that really doesn't work for developer initiatives. And it turns out that developers are actually the most difficult audience to please. And so that makes them the most important audience, because if you can make your developer uh, audience, the people you're trying to get to adopt your platform, if you can get them to be satisfied, pretty much everyone else is going to come along for the ride. And that's because everyone knows that in an adoption-led strategy, the developers really hold all the cards. They're the ones that are going to make the decision, are we going to adopt this technology or are we going to go use something else? So if you're a customer for technology, you're going to ask your engineers, how is this thing? Is it good? Is it bad? What, what, what should we do? If, if you're, uh, if you're wh whoever, if you're the press, if you're the analysts, you're going to ask independent developers, what do you guys think of this community? What do you guys think of, of how this company is engaging? So really the developers are, are, the, are the key audience. Next slide. What's most important to developers? Well, in a nutshell, transparency. Developers want to know everything there is to know about your strategy. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's difficult to do this, but
But that's why this is such a powerful technique. So they want to know the motivations. What are your goals? What are your objectives? What are you trying to accomplish by doing what you're doing? So in Sun's example, uh, you know, why open source Java? What are you trying to do? Uh, you know, whether the developer community likes your answers or not, it's very, very important to put it all out there on the table to explain what it is you're doing because the one thing that developers won't forgive is uh, uh, lies, uh, um, spin, all the things that marketing people often will, will do to try to adjust how people perceive a company. Developers really just push back at that and say, forget it. We're, we're, just, we're just not into that. So if developers see that you're on their side, that you're really trying to put it all out there, they can sometimes cut you some slack, even if they don't like your strategy completely. Next slide. Okay, so here's a few more questions. Do I have to answer the hard questions too? Absolutely, you must answer. In fact, that's the, the most important thing because adoption-led strategies are not new. Uh, developers know where the traps are. Developers know where the problems can crop up and they expect you to answer those questions. If you don't answer the questions, it's like a red flag. They're trying to hide something. If you do answer the questions and you answer them intelligently and with depth, then developers know that, you know, even if they don't agree with you, that you, you know what you're doing. Well, what if we don't know the answers? Well, how about that transparency thing? Just say, we don't know. That works very well. And especially if you then come back and, and uh, answer the questions later when you do know. Well, what if they don't like the answers? Well, the truth is what's going to earn you the respect and trust to allow you to have a strategy that may not completely solve all of the, uh, the problems that the community is looking to solve. You may have some goals and objectives that the community just isn't interested in or doesn't even agree with, but if your method for doing this, uh, this uh, 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 initiative matches up with their uh, uh, needs and objectives, sometimes you can uh, live together in the same community. Go ahead, Simon. Uh, one thing to, to emphasize here is, uh, well, actually, there's two things to emphasize. First of all, the FAQ isn't a static document. It's not something you write once and forget. Um, it's a document that you constantly update as you learn more and that where it's a, the way you communicate uh, to the whole community, but also to your whole internal team. Uh, the second thing to point out is that the FAQ is not necessarily about you, the great source of wisdom and knowledge, telling the poor, uneducated and unwashed outsiders what the truth is. This process is very much about you discovering how others see you. It's very much about you discovering what the flaws of your strategy are once you've embarked on it. It's about you discovering the truth yourself, not just you telling truth to others. And as a consequence, the FAQ uh, used in the way that we're describing here uh, can prove to be very challenging. It can lead you into places in discussion with your internal staff where you have big arguments as you discover that, 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 that you're doing things wrong and you've got to change things because that question that you're answering demonstrates that no, you can't, um, you know, we can't use the GPL in that way with that licensing exception because it will disrupt our business model. And you only discover that in the discussion that arises from talking uh, through the FAQ. It, uh, it's very much a learning journey that you're on as you do an FAQ. Uh, back to you, Rick. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the things that can happen is you actually uh, go through the process and you discover that um, that developers just aren't going to adopt your, your technology if you follow the strategy that you have in mind. So then you have a choice, change the strategy or don't change the strategy and don't use an adoption-led, developer-led uh, uh, model for, for, uh, for success. So you've got choices, but at least you won't be surprised and the community won't be surprised. Next slide. So let's look at an example. So this is from the open source Java FAQ. And so uh, the, the question is, why didn't you choose a license like BSD or Apache? Well, guess what? That's actually a really hard question. And the reason why it's hard 
uh, is is kind of involved. But there were at the time there were actually there were two uh, there were actually three different editions of Java: Micro Edition, Standard Edition, and Enterprise Edition. And uh, the Micro Edition is what ran on phones and uh, and uh, small devices, and the Standard Edition is what underlie the uh, server stuff as well as the desktop stuff. And so um, uh, we actually did two different licenses. We did the straight GPL for the micro edition, and we did the GPL with the class path exception, which is kind of like LGPL for standard edition. Well, why did we do that? Well, we wanted to drive more adoption of Java standard edition, especially within Linux distributions. And so how did we do that? We picked a license that matched up with Linux's license. And um, we, uh, we offered that uh, out to, uh, to uh, Linux distributions. Uh, it, this um, allowed, but with, with the straight GPL for the micro edition, it minimized the likelihood that we were going to have incompatible forks. So the, the value proposition for Java, write once, run anywhere, uh, really relied on API level compatibility across all the different implementations of Java. And we were really trying to stop uh, things from, uh, from forking. We wanted to get a lot of different uh, uh, elements of the open source world uh, uh, engaged and involved and contributing. And we want, but you know, the, the final thing that was probably most important to Sun's executives was to protect and uh, enhance the uh, binary licensing uh, business. So jo Sun made a ton of money on Java and they made it primarily through binary licensing. So we had this, this very difficult uh, uh, push and pull between wanting to engage the community and wanting to maintain a binary OEM licensing model. And so we saw we solved it with this sort of hybrid licensing strategy that really didn't please anybody. In fact, I mean, look at Android. Android uh, came out with uh, uh, class libraries that were licensed under, uh, uh, what, what, what did they license it with? Was it Apache? Yeah. Yeah, it was Apache. And so, and that was because they knew that, that um, you know, all those phone manufacturers, they all wanted to be able to uh, mix their uh, proprietary uh, cellular modems and everything else with the open stuff and not have to publish the source code for it. And it was kind of a non-starter for, for them unless they bought a binary license from Sun. And that's why Sun did, did what they did. You want to add anything to that, Simon? No, no, go, go, carry on. Okay. Okay, so next slide. Uh, what goes into an FAQ? So on the left side, we already talked about some of the characteristics, the transparency, the completeness, the hard questions, but what topics do you actually address? Well, think about all of the people who are going to engage with your technology. What could possibly make things blow up? What's going to upset people? What are people going to look for? What are your goals and objectives? How is it licensed? Uh, what are the terms of participation? How does the contribution agreements work? What are the roadmaps and the schedules and how, how will it be released? How will the community come together? Uh, what's a, what, how does this play uh, in the overall ecosystem with competitors, et cetera? Where do you get more information? Well. The FAQ needs to cover all of that stuff and needs to unwrap all of these questions to the point where you have really solid answers to all of this stuff and it all hangs together as a sensible overall strategy. You can have a separate FAQ for your technical uh, usage questions, but um, the general FAQ, it doesn't replace the documentation, but it answers all of these questions. Next slide. So how do you get started? Well, this is not an easy process. You have to start early. You build a cross-functional team where everybody has the uh, has decision-making uh, capacity, and then you divide and conquer. You take the different pieces of the FAQ. You uh, uh, give it to the people who are the experts in your company, and then you um, continue to meet and uh, resolve conflicts and planning issues. 
uh, and you engage your leadership and force uh, decisions through this process to get to a sensible strategy that's going to work. Next slide. So who should write this FAQ? Simon, what do you think? Well, it's got to be somebody who uh, is bridging the worlds of technical and business. Uh, so it can't just be your uh, your project lead. It can't just be your uh, a product owner in the business. It needs to be somebody who is able to sit between those two worlds. Uh, someone who's really good with words and can craft very carefully sprung text that, that tells the truth in a concise and compelling way. Uh, you've got to have somebody who can resolve conflicts and to br who bring people together. And you've got to have somebody who understands developers and can engage the developer community and, and uh, get trust from them. Uh, and the obvious person to do that is the person that you've employed to be the community manager for the project that's involved. Uh, you could do it with a centralized person from an OSPO. Uh, the, the only challenge with doing that is that person won't be completely uh, uh, aware of all of the issues with the product strategy, direction, and business plan. Uh, in our case, it was Rich. Rich was the perfect guy to do this. Um, he's he's uh, uh, aware of all the issues. He is a conciliator and a bridge builder. Uh, he uh, it sees conflict as an opportunity to build agreement and move on to the next step. And uh, so he he did a great job. And congratulations, Rich. Uh, it was really I think we got Java launch basically because you were on board, although uh, everybody else on the team thought it was them as well. So um, there's, you know, that's, that's a that's a small uh, 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 benefit for you. Um, the other thing to, to recognize is that it's really important to have the leadership of the company or uh, at very least the overall leadership responsible for your product on board for this strategy, because this strategy is going to create conflict in the company. It is going to force you to face uh, the way your community sees you honestly. It is going to force you to admit what your true motivations and objectives are openly to your team, as well as probably to the public. Uh, though the, your, your leadership team is going to have to be willing to make compromises to handle hard questions. Otherwise, you're just going to raise all the questions from the community and you will craft for yourself the weapons that are used to kill you. Um, if you if you embrace this process, then uh, you will probably need to agree to surrender a little of your control of the product to the process itself. Um, this is really hard if you're a, a C-level executive. You expect to call the shots. You don't expect to have the community or your staff call the shots. But if you want to succeed with uh, getting your open source software adopted for your business benefit, you're going to have to get on board and agree with all of these things. Um, the other challenge, oh, uh, Rich, carry on. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention uh Changing incentives, it's that little bullet in the middle. That's one of the toughest ones. Because if you've got a product that you've been making a ton of money on, and all of a sudden the source code to that product is out there for anyone to use, to fork, to do whatever they want with, um, well, what's what are the OEM sales reps going to do when they can't buy their next Mercedes? Because uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the OEM sales business is drying up. Uh, well, you you need to figure out how you're going to deal with that in your company. You need to figure out how you're going to tell your investors how you're going to continue to make money uh, with uh, an entirely new strategy. I think incentives are a really crucial uh, element. Okay. Uh, we're going to need to skip on because we're, we're almost out of time here. So we might actually skip over some slides. Um one big challenge you're going to face is that your legal department will tell you that speaking openly and honestly about your motivations, your product is too risky. And I just want to confirm for you that it is really, really risky. Um, I had to appear in court as a witness in the Google Oracle trial. And I found that uh, that Oracle um, made me do a video deposition and brought up our email correspondence from the process of doing this FAQ uh, as uh, questions during that deposition. That was 10 years later. Uh, and also the decisions we made about open sourcing Java during this process became key elements in the Java Oracle trial 10 years later. And all of the, the materials we used in discussing it were produced 
by both parties, by Google and Oracle, as evidence during that, that trial. So it, legal are right. This is a risky thing to do. And uh, it may well be that that risk is too big for your team to be willing to take on. Um, there's no sense in which writing an FAQ explaining your project is a trivial, casual thing to set about doing. Um, uh, Rich, do you want to talk about this? We've got about two sure. minutes. So, so at the 11th hour, just before we uh, open sourced, uh, did the code drop for OpenJDK, one of the senior executives at Sun tried to stage a coup. Uh, basically said, you know, we, I've never really been on board with this whole uh, transparency thing. Let's just get rid of that FAQ and do a really simple, small one. Uh, and uh, this, I think, illustrates why having your leadership on board is so important. Uh, because, uh, you know, there were some people who agreed with that executive. But by then, the engineering executives who really uh, ran the show at Sun uh, were pretty well sold on uh, transparency, and uh, they pushed back. But it took a few of us um, having to threaten to quit in protest uh, in order to get uh, that FAQ published. So you've got to really be sure your leadership has your back. Next slide. Okay, where are we? Oh. I could probably skip over that, Rich. Yeah, let's skip over this one. So other marketing and communications. Um, so uh, this is one of the, the side benefits of the FAQ. You've actually done most of the marketing work with that FAQ. It's a source material for all of the rest of your, uh, your marketing materials, uh, speakers, guides, keynotes, et cetera. So when all of the questions have clear and true answers, and you can just point people at them. You save a lot of time and effort. Next. OK, so. Um, uh, oh, that's another one of yours. Uh, you're going backwards. Well, I went backwards. I'm just getting getting spooked here. So did it all work? Well, uh, you'll remember back at the beginning of this process, um, the one of the challenges we faced was that Richard Stallman had written an article uh, that uh, called uh, The Java Trap that utterly condemned us in the most coruscating and uh, plain way which only Richard is able to master. And uh, at the end of that process, um, we got to, uh, to this. The GNU General Public License is the most popular and most widely used free software license. The special thing about this license is that it's a copyleft license. That is to say, all versions of the program must carry the same license. So the freedoms that the GNU GPL gives to the users must reach all the users of the program. And that's the purpose for which I wrote it. It'll be very good that the Java trap won't exist anymore. It'll be a thing of the past. That kind of problem can still exist in other areas, but it won't exist for Java anymore. I think Sun has well, with this contribution, have contributed more than any other company to the free software community in the form of software. And it shows leadership. It's an example I hope others will follow. Uh, <laughs> GNU Hang on. There we go. Um, so... Uh, the output of this was uh, we actually did persuade Richard Stallman to write to record a promotional video for Sun um, promoting uh, open source Java, um, which um, really was beyond our expectations at the time. I think it's fair to say, Rich. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, Richard Stallman uh, uh, didn't change his mind all that often. Yeah, and, uh, we we uh, we solved uh, we got him to change his mind by being completely transparent about what we were doing and why we were doing it. All right. So we're, we're pretty much out of time here. Uh, if you look at the rest of the slides, um, uh, you'll find a, a how to in how to do the FAQ. Um, and both Rich and I will be very pleased to uh, work with you on preparing this strategy, if you wish. Uh, 
it, it is a, a big undertaking and you need to have your management lined up carefully and you need to make sure that uh, you are as authentic as possible because ultimately authenticity is the key to using an FAQ to manage that corporate community boundary. Uh, telling the truth and making it clear that you are indeed telling the truth and taking the question seriously is ultimately the key to your being successfully accepted. Rich has written, uh, uh, as you would expect, the mother of all FAQs about writing the mother of all FAQs. And there's a link uh, to his resources just there. And a number of other resources are available. And apart from that, uh, please do feel free to email us uh, if you've got any further questions. Did you have any final words, Rich? Nope, that's it. 